for a very generous <laughs> introduction and thank you, Daniel, um, also for having me here and to the departments of Gender and Sexuality Studies and International Studies for hosting me. I'm uh, grateful that you guys are all here. At least you're out uh, inside from the cold. Um, I wasn't quite expecting it to be so cold here. Um, okay. Uh, I want to begin by asking you to think about uh, the last few interventions by the US. Um, imagine women. Uh, where are the women in these interventions and which women? The Kurdish Peshmerga women and female suicide bombers. The Emirati female pilot, which was made to uh, which was made a symbol of transformation of Arab women. Um, Yazidi slave girls and radicalized young Muslim European women. For a crowd such as yours, I don't have to talk about the representational politics of gender. I'm sure many of you have already had quite an encounter with the question of gender. So of course, what these images bring home is the force the sheer power of images to persuade us about what is happening. Now, I want, what I want to do is I want to talk about what these images mean and what uh, mythologies they essentially invoke. What I want to do instead is to think through not necessarily the representational politics at play in these photographs, but about the way gender shapes and structures counterinsurgency practices. I call this gender structuring the invisible sinews because gender is the connective tissue building a whole series of seemingly disparate activities together across vast geographies, social classes, and power configurations. Now, what is counterinsurgency? I'm sure you guys have all heard about it within the last few years. The US has been very much involved in it, and so it has been in the news. Counterinsurgency is defined as asymmetrical warfare by a powerful military against irregular combatants supported by civilian population. So it is asymmetrical. There are two asymmetric forces fighting each other. And it's not just asymmetrical like the US fighting Marshall Islands, but it's also against irregular combatants. So I think that that's quite important. They're not regular military combatants. And those irregular combatants are supported by civilian populations. That element is enormously important. Now, counterinsurgency itself, as, as old as warfare, but the term was coined actually by John F. Kennedy in 1960. But this method, the, the particular methods that are involved in fighting counterinsurgencies, have actually been a mainstay of colonial war fighting and imperial policing since about the 19th century. While a substantial uh, portion of the training, doctrinal development, and war fighting capabilities of European colonial militaries was devoted to this type of war in their overseas colonies in the 19th and 20th century, the US Army has also accumulated counterinsurgency experience when it actually expanded colonially to the Caribbean and, uh, and, and to, to, to the Pacific Islands. And then, and of course, long before that, against Native Americans uh, and their su suppression and circumscription in reservations in this country. As anti-colonial struggles spread across the globe in the wake of the Second World War, counterinsurgency warfare was intended to quash it. And even after the 1960s, counterinsurgency continued to be an important element of US military policy in Latin America <coughs> and elsewhere. This, uh, the top image is the British in Kenya, and the bottom image is uh, the Malayan emergency, which the British also fought in 1948 to 1958. Since the end of the Cold War, counterinsurgency has become much more closely associated with a family of other military operations that don't necessarily resemble conventional warfare. This, these kinds of um, other kinds of war are called foreign internal defense. So somebody else is fighting an, uh, an internal counterinsurgency and you support or fight against them. <laughs> Stability operations. Um, reconstruction operations to which militaries are sent, and counter-terrorist operations. Counterinsurgency is now considered the most significant and frequent form of warfare to be fought across the world and into the future by various kinds of organizations. As a US Navy strategy document argues, this form of conflict necessitates a partnership between, and I quote, 
governments, non-governmental organizations, international organizations, and the private sector to ensure continued stable functioning of the international system, which guarantees the core interests of the United States. So essentially, it's a war intended to be fought in order to preserve US interests. During the long history of small wars, which is the British name for these kinds of wars, and colonial counterinsurgencies, today's advocates of population counterinsurgency, now population-centric counterinsurgency is the one in which you're supposed to focus on the civilian population rather than on, on the actual combatants. So the population-centric counterinsurgency advocates present this, present counterinsurgency as a kind of soft option as compared with, for example, scorched earth policies of big militaries. Why is it a soft option? Because it often involves ways of bribing or persuading the civilian population to come to your side. How do you bribe or persuade them? You throw roads or schools or whatever their way. And of course, none of these things, the roads or the schools or the health centers are necessarily um, done as a kind of a, just a good thing to be given to the power public, but they often have a dual use. Roads, for example, in particular, are used for military, as a kind of an infrastructure for military um, activities. Um, and, it's, and it's supposed to be a humanitarian option. In the population-centric uh, doctrine, which was advanced in the 2007 version of the US Army and Marines Counterinsurgency Manual, and uh, other current classics of counterinsurgency, including John Noggle's Eating Soup with a Knife and David Kilcullen's uh, The Accidental Gorilla, which I don't have on there. Kinetic force, or the killing capacity of the military, takes backstage foregrounding developmental language and agendas such as, and I'm quoting from the counterinsurgency field manual, a vibrant economy, political participation, and restored hope. The kinds of operations that are involved are psychological and, in, uh, and, and information operations. Psychological operations and information operations are essentially ways of uh, lying about what you're doing, persuading publics about what you're doing is being a good thing. The use of local proxies, uh, so local clients that act for you, and the integration of civilian and military efforts, including aid and governance in order to ultimately win over a largely uncommitted civilian population. I think it's really important to note that in the 2013 version of the counterinsurgency field manual, which was released without the fanfare of the 2007 version, but although much of this language is present, what is now being emphasized and what has happened between 2000 and 2000, 2007 and 2013, of course, is the, 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 the US, uh, at the, because of the massive expenditure of blood and treasure being forced out of Iraq, what the 2013 field manual says is that we need to focus on the local proxies more than anything else. So it's no longer boots on the ground, so much as having the local forces fight for you and you provide advisory office to them. This, working through clients, ends up becoming crucial and the more low-cost option in investments of blood and treasure. Now, this coding of counterinsurgency as the civilianized option, which aims at winning the hearts and minds of civilian populations and persuading them to support the counterinsurgents, has a particularly gendered character. As I don't have to say here, gendering is neither about women alone, it's also about the range of ways in which we define masculinity and femininity, nor is it a pure and autonomous dichotomy. Rather, masculinities and femininities, especially in imperial contexts, are already always cross-hatched with racial and class designations and dimensions. At one level, counterinsurgency itself is counterposed as the opposite of a more mechanized, technologically advanced, higher power power form of uh, warfare. Given that the latter is often coded as hypermasculine, the big kind of war that you use jets and tanks for is hypermasculine, the former, counterinsurgency, which tends to draw on uh, working civilians, and I said developmental language, is often coded as feminine. Second, the very object of population-centric counterinsurgency is often perceived as feminine. Since the focus of counterinsurgency is the transformation of civilian populations rather than combatants. On the one hand, in the binary categorization, which forms the basis of mainstream discourses about war, 
Civilian is the opposite of combatants. So the civilian feminine is the opposite of combatant masculine. But on the other hand, those spaces and subjectivities which regular warfare destroys as a matter of side effect rather than intent, the collateral damage, or which are considered collateral to the main job of war fighting in conventional warfare, are demarginalized, they brought into focus, and in some senses made central to the work of military and civilian counterinsurgents. <coughs> These civilian spaces and subjectivities are perceived by both the military and the civilians as gendered in particular and specific sorts of ways. And I'll get into that in a minute. I'll explain what I mean by that. Finally, the practice of counterinsurgency itself is predicated on telling which is a term that um, Alan Feldman uses in talking about Northern Ireland. You tell by looking at com uh, how to tell, how to distinguish combatants from civilians, hostiles from friendlies, etc. But um, the practice of counterinsurgency itself is predicated on telling, invading, organizing, fighting, detaining, transforming, and destroying, all on the basis of gender, again cross-hashed with class and race. Now, we know from a wealth of scholarship that war and violence have always been gendered, classed and racialized, not only in the practical way that they're fought, but also in the longer term or uh, quotidian manner that they shape social relations and are shaped by them. Moreover, we know that the discursive practices surrounding war also reproduce existing gender hierarchies through the constant reproduction of a dichotomous rhetoric of masculinities and femininities. What is new with counterinsurgency is the extent to which the centrality of civilians as potential objects of military operations is acknowledged in both doctrine and practice, and even, perhaps especially, as civilians are instrumentalized as part and parcel of the, um, of the process of the war. Further, as mentioned above, uh, counterinsurgency doctrine and practice directly brings those bodies and spaces which were previously coded as private or feminine, which are women, non-combatant men, and the spaces of the home, into the battlefield, transform cities and homes and persons into highly gendered segments of the physical and human terrain, which is the language of counterinsurgency, and utilize detailed knowledge about the quotidian or everyday, both perceived and coded as feminine, as ethnographic intelligence. It brings it in. This conquered and gendered space in which an indigenous population is controlled, surveilled, monitored, and made to acquiesce is the first site where I shall analyze gender practices of counterinsurgency. Demography is one of the micro practices of counterinsurgency um, which works in the field. Gender demographies are here often invoked with both justific as justification for targeting young men and more instrumentally for planning military action. For example, on a larger, kind of a more strategic level, the language of youth bulge often emerges. Youth bulges uh, where a democratic profusion of men between the ages of 15 and 30, especially in Muslim <coughs> countries, is seen as a structural condition underlying extremism and as a problem to be addressed militarily in faraway places. Young men are seen as automatically useful resource for radical recruitment, and women's education and job creation programs are advocated as necessary antidotes. I'm quoting all of these from strategic writings about uh, reduced bulges that appear in military um, documents. This ostensible gender imbalance is utilized to demobilize militant groups. So what you do is, if you've got young men, they're all going to become radicalized. The, the strategic thing says, if you educate women, you will, um, you will offset this radicalization. As a former U.S. defense official wrote, governments, and I quote, governments can use groups' ambivalence about female members to state advantage. Israel and Russia use stories of socially marginal women being exploited by men to discredit terrorist group and explain away female violence. Another route is through gender, um, main, uh, gender mainstreaming folded into military interventions. The feminized security discourse is deployed by all and sundry, and gender mainstreaming becomes even central to military intervention. Gender mainstreaming is, as you know, a language that is used in a lot of developmental UNDP kind of stuff where you introduce gender into everything that you do. <coughs> Policymakers, for example, argue that by providing economic development specifically to suit women, women can be saved from alienation and radicalization. Women are cast as wholly socioeconomic beings divested of politics or ethics. 
under the heading of why the military should care, two US officers, both of them women, suggest that, and I quote, by collaborating with USA and using, in, uh, using women in development's expertise, women in development is a program of USA, using women in development's expertise on gender integration as part of a comprehensive counterterrorism strategy, the military can more effectively address the negative socioeconomic conditions that make areas ripe for terrorist exploitation, end quote. In a highly influential and much circulated set of guidance notes, the counterinsurgency guru David Kilcullen similarly argues that, and I quote, co-opting neutral or friendly women through targeted social and economic programs builds networks of enlightened self-interest that eventually undermine the insurgents. With the women, you uh, win the women and you own the family unit. Own the family and you take a big step forward in mobilizing the population on the side of the counterinsurgents, end quote. Just as important, the very sites of counterinsurgency are usually civilian spaces that are then walled off, both figuratively and literally, as a subsection of battle space. A great square that can be more easily pacified. In counterinsurgency, all spaces, and perhaps especially urban quarters, are seen as potential battle battlegrounds by the counterinsurgents. The conventional privacy measures for homes and the peacefulness of everyday spaces are no longer guaranteed. Spaces often not only coded as feminine, but also considered women's domain, like homes, hospitals, and schools especially, are frequently invaded by counterinsurgents. These private or civilian spaces, the homes, the school, the hospital, the market, the village, are increasingly targeted in modern wars, and in fact were specifically the, sub the object of intense bombing in conventional warfare also in the 20th century. What counterinsurgency does, however, is to try to transform these spaces without necessarily destroying them, although destruction, especially in the wake of population resettlement, is sometimes inevitable. Thus, co-opting everyday packed spaces into landscapes of war. Inevitably, these everyday landscapes are inhabited by civilians who are also made to be figures in the ongoing counterinsurgency. The utilization of these spaces in counterinsurgency is directly and intimately tied up with the ways in which counterinsurgency practice makes men and women legible and assigns them to different categories of various utility for combat, combat, combat and pacifications. In 2004, for example, a large number of Iraqi cities were either surrounded by barbed wire, under constant monitoring, or both. House invasions were often the norm. In these circumstances, women became direct targets of violence. They were taken as hostages to compel the men to surrender. Their homes were destroyed. And they were specifically targeted because of supposedly intuitive understanding of the enormity of attacking women and the ways in which such targeting could send a message to the others. There are actually documents in which they say, if you actually go into the houses where there are women, this will send a message to the terrorists. In one <coughs> instance, the US, and I quote from an oral history, a military oral history, in US Army oral history, um, quote, soldiers came to the house of an Iraqi man suspected of hijacking trucks. He wasn't there, but his wife and two other women answered the door. You have 15 minutes to get your furniture out, First Sergeant uh, uh, Galeb Mikhail said. The women wailed and shouted, but ultimately complied, dragging their bed and couch and television set out the front door. Mikhail's men then fired four anti-tank missiles into their house, blowing it to pieces and setting it afire. The women were left holding their belongings. At a news conference in November 2003, Sanchez, a top commander in Iraq, acknowledged that he had authorized the destruction of homes thought to be used by insurgents. That same month, American officers said that they detained the wife and daughter of General Izzat Ibrahim, who just was recently killed, a high-ranking member of Hussein's government who was still at large. They hoped, they said, that the women, uh, that the capture of the women would lead them to Ibrahim, which they didn't do. I think I need to point out at this stage that General Ibrahim is, um, is, was, until last week, said to be fighting with ISIS in the takeover of Mosul and the routing of the Iraqi military from the city about a year ago. So it's quite interesting that that hostage taking didn't do anything. Men are differentially targeted in these wars. In the cordon cities where retinal scans, thumb prints, identity cards, and registers of residents are used to monitor the populations as they were in a number of cities in Iraq, men between the ages of 15 and 16 or 50 are considered the primary target of this intensive, aggressive, and invasive surveillance. 
This targeting of men also conveniently serves another function. It allows for the soldiers to specifically, the counterinsurgent soldiers, to specifically effeminize the men of the population through both symbolic and practical emasculation. Such tactics include the undressing of men at checkpoints and in prisons, as you've seen pictures of Abu Ghraib, and the use of language which is intended to dishonor men. This particularly comes out of an Orientalist understanding of what is considered honorable or shameful in Muslim culture, and which presents this culture's notion of indignity and abuse as exceptional. So that you, you'll hear a lot about the reason that they did what they did in Abu Ghraib was because Muslim men really are very embarrassed about being naked, and therefore this was supposed to send them a message. Of course, the, the kind of humiliation people were subjected at Abu Ghraib, anybody, regardless of whether or not they're Muslim, uh, would consider humiliating. Here, I, I think it's also worth noting that the uh, caliph of ISIS, uh, Baghdadi, was said to have been a prisoner of the US in Camp Baka, one of the largest prison camps, and subjected to some of this humiliation. So the long-term effects of that kind of a capture, again, is not to dissuade people, but perhaps to actually further radicalize them. A more complicated set of gendering practices occurs not at the end point of application of counterinsurgency force, but at the seam of encounter between the occupying military forces and the people subjected to counterinsurgency. This seam is the messy interstitial space in which the cross-hatching of race, gender, class, and empire all produce unexpected hierarchical positioning. <coughs> Here, two groups in particular stand out the women from the invading and occupying military, and the local men who serve as proxy enforcers of order for the invading military. So the, the local military forces that are uh, working alongside the US forces. In the first instance, the displacement of inequalities to a new colonial setting suddenly inverts orders of hierarchy, and women from disadvantaged backgrounds can suddenly become powerful players positioned against and above local males. This inversion of hierarchies is reinforced by representing the arrested and incarcerated men as rapists and of the local male population as oppressors of their women and families. I think it's really important, for example, I'll get to this, but um, it is important to think about the kind of background that Sabrina Harman, the woman in the top picture, and Lindy England, the woman in the middle picture, have, and I'll talk about that in a, mo in a moment. As Anne McClintock has written in a different context, the vast fissured architecture of imperialism is gendered throughout by the fact that it was white men who made and enforced laws and policies in their own interests. Nonetheless, the rationed privileges of race all too often put white women in positions of decided, if borrowed, power, not only over colonized women, but also over colonized men. As such, white women were not the hapless onlookers of empire, but were ambiguously complicit, both as colonizer and colonized, privileged and restricted, acted upon and acting." End quote. The peculiarities of this positioning were working class women from the least privileged parts of the US found themselves in positions of power vis-a-vis -vis Iraqi men has been best personified in the narratives about Lindy England and Sabrina Harmon. England and Harmon have become iconic figures symbolizing the torture, inflicted, the torture inflicted upon Iraqi men in Abu Ghraib prison. Sabrina Harman held a leash, uh, sorry, Lindy England held a leash encircling the neck of a naked Iraqi man curled up in a vulnerable fetal position. The latter had herself photographed, uh, Sabrina Harman had herself photographed smiling cherubically and giving a thumbs up sign while leaning close to the dead body, I don't have that picture here, of a visibly bruised and battered Iraqi general. The US prison guards and interrogators who had inflicted pain upon Iraqi captives never managed to generate the same, the men, the men who did this, never gener managed to generate the same sense of disgust as England and Harman. The men were never made the archetypes of US torture. Whenever you hear about Abu Ghraib, this is the picture you see. Nobody ever talks about Charles Grainer, the guy in the back, who actually directed some of this torture and who had been previously himself a prison warden in the US using some of those tortures of American prisoners, black American prisoners in this country. And he got 10 years, but people don't even know his name. Whereas Lindy England, everybody knows. 
Not only were England and Harmon the iconic representations of transgressive women, they were also subtly the embodiment of a new hierarchy of power, in which white women were automatically placed in superior position to men who in other circumstances would have been the expected superiors. For example, an Iraqi general's class position would be far more privileged than, the, than that of a daughter of a police detective, Harmon, or England, who had worked in a poultry factory. But in a colonial war situation, those kinds of power hierarchies are reversed. In the instances where women have been used as interrogators, their bodies and their sexuality have been deployed as technologies of power. In one of the most disturbing accounts of interrogations of the Guantanamo Bay prisons, a male interrogator writes about female interrogators using their breasts, their bodies, and their menstrual blood as necessary tools for achieving this, uh, the, their dictated aims of getting the people to talk. This narrative is a little bit long, but I want to actually read it all because I think it's very persuasive. This is from the memoirs of an interrogator at Guantanamo Bay. We return to the interrogation book, uh, booth. Brooke, the female interrogator, and I were both in our sanitized BDUs, battle dress uniforms. Sanitized means that their names were taped over so you couldn't see it. To my surprise, she started to unbutton her top slowly, teasingly, almost like a stripper, revealing a skin-tight brown army t-shirt stretching over her chest. Farid, the uh, Saudi prisoner, wouldn't look at her. What is the matter, Farid? Don't you like women? As she said this, she stood in front of him and tried to make him look at her body. She walked slowly behind him and began rubbing her breast against his back. Do you like these big American tits, Farid, she said. What do you think, Farid, she said, placing her hands on her breast. He glanced, saw what she was doing, and immediately looked away. Are you gay? Why do you keep looking at him? Brooke asked, referring to me. She started unbuttoning her BDU pants. Brie, did you know that I'm having my period, she said. She placed her hands in her pants as she started to circle behind the detainee. How do you feel about me touching you now? Brooke came back around this, his other side, and he could see that she was beginning to withdraw her hand from her pants. As it became visible, the Saudi saw what looked like red blood on her hand. You fuck, she hissed, wiping what he believed was menstrual blood on his face. What do you think your brothers will think of you in the morning when they see an American woman's menstrual blood on your face? Brooke said, standing up. By the way, we've shut off the water in your cell tonight, so the blood will still be there tomorrow. End quote. It wasn't actually blood. She used ink. But nevertheless, he didn't know that. The uncritical self-abnegation of the white interrogator woman in the service of some nationalist understanding of national security is part of the peculiar gendering of counterinsurgency practices. In conventional wars where laws of war and the Geneva Conventions apply, such interrogations would not, could not, should not happen with the degree of legitimacy and sang froid which seems to have happened in the war on terror. A much more banal representation of this theme of encounter, and perhaps in many respects more important because more pervasive, has been the ease with which women have moved into combat roles, serving the empire unquestioningly, with their integration into these roles being celebrated as some form of liberationist politics. So when exa for example, when I showed you the picture of the Emirati pilot uh, being made into an icon, something of this liberationist politics is what I'm talking about. Um, is, is you know, women are celebrated for actually going out and doing killing. A second space in the theme of encounter where genders are inflected through <coughs> racial, class, or imperial hierarchies is the site of encounter between US military men and the local security forces who act as proxies for the conquering army. <coughs> Training and developing indigenous police and military forces is a central tenet of counterinsurgency. The tasks here include, and I quote, developing a US style training base, embedding advisors, initiating an intensive collective training program, and partnering American units with indigenous units. Yet the local men who often risk opprobrium and who often join the security forces as a way of guaranteeing a livelihood in conditions where security is the only steady sort of income, are constantly berated, effeminated, effeminized, and called women or pussies and seen as inadequate and passive enforcers of good order by their American trainers. Here, masculinity alone does not form the basis of transnational solidarity. And again, gender hierarchies are strongly shaded by other factors, such as class, race, ethnicity, language and religion, subculture, sexualities, and almost any other form through which humans understand difference and strive to make it count. In the context of the war on terror, the men who are located in the scene of encounter 
the, the, these guys who work in units working with the U.S. Um, are cast in these seemingly contradictory ways. They can be at once courageous and manly allies, and at the same time they could be seen as too weak, not good enough, and actually in many instances, particularly in Afghanistan, they're seen as sodomizing homosexual rapists, and I'm quoting from their writing. A particularly revealing account from a former US military man, again from US military oral histories, um, stationed in Afghanistan, contains all the various kinds of cliches and tropes that actually cover all of these kinds of tensions. So I'm quoting from this oral history. Homosexuality was pervasive among the Afghans, especially the Pashtuns in the south. Even when they weren't overtly engaged in acts of sex, they would cling to each other, hold each other's hands, and generally cavort in ways that would astonish Westerners and repulse the soldiers. Some of the Marines would laugh incredulously. Others would be moved to violent action. In one case, Fitzgerald watched a gigantic Marine march furiously toward two coupled Afghans and pick them up and toss them in different directions like dogs, yelling the whole time in English the Afghans couldn't understand. These are Afghans that actually were working with the US. They weren't the enemy. The female of the two scurried away. The dominant male was sort of indignant and flipped the scarf over his shoulder and walked off, end quote. The Pashtun, or the warrior allies, in this narrative are compared to dogs and effeminized, not only because of the sexual acts of which the masculine US Marine disapproves, but also because they hold each other's hands and repulse Westerners with their homosociality. So it's not just that they have sex with each other, but also just the fact that holding hands together is seen as repulsive. Even the story draws on masculine and feminine images. A gigantic Marine stands for unspoiled American masculinity, while an indignant Pashtun flips his scarf. These are kind of tropes associated with teenage girls, invoking cliched imagery of petulant teenage girls flipping their hair in exasperation. So this theme of encounter, then, is the place where class, race, and gender are brought together most urgently, with masculinities always hitched to a particular kind of sexuality, and an iterative ordering of hierarchies is constantly performed. <coughs> The third side of gendering uh, is the location of production of counterinsurgency policy and doctrine. So Washington, D.C., but also various other centers of power. Two ways in which counterinsurgency practice and discourse has become gendered in the metropole have been most striking. On the one hand, the creation of a new counterinsurgent masculinity, that of the soldier scholar. And on the other hand, the appropriation of a colonial feminist discourse and its saturating of counterinsurgency discourse by women bureaucrats and policymakers who explicitly ally their counterinsurgency credentials to their gendered identities. In analyzing masculinities, Terrell Carver has written that, and I quote, the rational bureaucratic modern man is not so distant from the warrior protector man of tradition, in that organized warfare and organized trade are not as conceptually, constitutively, and practically distant as one is led to think. Indeed, in terms of the revolving doors between government officials, elected and non-elected, and the arms trade and so-called defense industries, combined with the technologized nature of contemporary civilized warfare, it would seem that the two masculinities, the rational bureaucratic and the warrior uh, protector, are effectively merged, end quote. In a sense, this applies to the soldier-scholar um, masculinity as well. But as important are the subtle transformations and differences and the notion of masculinity that class brings here. The soldier scholars are numerous and well-known. They are also overwhelmingly represented in the ranks of counterinsurgents. David Petraeus has a PhD in international relations. David Kjell has a PhD in political science. John Muggle has a PhD in history. H.R. McMaster has a PhD in history. And they're all vocal, articulate, and highly educated military or ex-military men, all of whom are ranked above captain, all of whom are engaged in policy making vis-a-vis -vis the war on terror, and all of whom are enthusiastic counterinsurgents. Some have written in influential books and articles on counterinsurgency. Others have been online or think tank presences pushing forward a counterinsurgency agenda. While Petraeus first directed the US war effort in Iraq, and later head the, headed the US Central Command before becoming the head of CIA. Not only is the soldier scholar the ultimate in civic virtue, but is also the embodiment of international wisdom, war fighting prowess, and a kind of knowingness about the world. That's the way they're often represented. 
Even the official discourse around counterinsurgency reflects this shift. The 2007 version of the counterinsurgency field manual compares regular fighters to that ultimate icon of raw physical masculinity, a pugilist, a boxer, who is nevertheless blind and is wasting energy flailing at unseen opponents and perhaps causing unintended harm. However, a counterinsurgent with access to military intelligence transforms, uh, is, is transformed into, and I quote, surgeons cutting out cancerous tissue while keeping other vital organs intact, end quote. So on the one hand, we have the wholly embodied presence of the boxer, an old school form of masculinity. And on the other hand, the precise intellect of the surgeon, a new kind of masculinity. The theoreticians of counterinsurgency obviously prefer the surgeon. Not only does this counterpositioning of boxers and surgeons contains an implicit notion of masculinity, perhaps even more importantly, it hides within, uh, within plain sight a particular gradation of class. The boxer is the working class hero. The, sur the surgeon is the upper middle class professional. The former is emotional, embodied, perhaps even rational. The latter is intellectual, cool, steady handed. So you're having in these kinds of metaphors all sorts of gender class um, kind of uh, assumptions woven into each other. Alongside this new form of masculinity, a much more familiar colonial feminism is crucial in advancing a particularly new form of metropolitan warrior femininity. The colonial feminism of today deploys the language of humanitarian rescue. A feminized security rhetoric has become commonplace in administration, so much so, this is from a report on these uh, women warriors, so much so that it is typical for an official who gives a speech about American action in Iraq and Afghanistan or about US policy of promoting democracy around the world to draw the connection to the pursuit of women's rights. So we're doing whatever we're doing overseas because we're saving women's rights. This colonial feminism is appealing to a new category of women policymakers who pride themselves in a kind of collaborative warrior femininity. These counterinsurgent women not only deploy a gendered analysis in their discussion of counterinsurgency. So for example, they talk about uh, counterinsurgency operations require deep emotional IQ, uh, IQ, and women have a more collaborative style, I'm quoting from these, but also use feminist justifications for their involvement. They say, for example, we aren't going to win by telling half the population they can't play, end quote. The counterinsurgent women have been particularly crucial in creating or sustaining the humanitarian element of the war on terror. The human terrain system, which was, uh, which was a system that uses social scientists to go out there and essentially collect intelligence on local communities, was originally conceived by a counterinsurgent woman, Montgomery McFay, who wrote her doctoral thesis in cultural anthropology on British counterinsurgency in Northern Ireland and who was for a while a highly visible figure, both as a target of US anthropologists' anger and as a fashionable and uber-feminine uber policy wonk. She often um, idolized uh, military men. She even anonymously ran a blog called I Love a Man in Uniform and often posted, um, posted images of herself in extreme high fashion on there. So it, she, she, she was having a kind of a warrior femininity, but almost, uh, almost cartoonish in its, in its hyper-fashionableness. McFaith, in becoming a fellow at the Office of Naval Research, shed her nose ring, realized, uh, quote unquote, realizing there were certain semiotic cues that would um, unnerve paranoidal old white men, end quote. She found no contradiction between her awareness of gender differences of old white men and counterinsurgent women and the particularly militarist role that she envisioned for social scientists. As significant are the new category of women security scholars who circulate between the domains of academy, think tank, and the policymaking world. Some of these women have been prominent over the last decade. Sarah Sewell was, for example, in addition to having formerly headed the Carr Center for Human Rights at Harvard and having been the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Peacekeeping during the Clinton administration, had also authored the foreword to the 2007 version of the Counterinsurgency Field Manual. Samantha Power probably needs no introduction. She was a strong advocate of humanitarian military intervention and, and the author of a book about Rwanda, 
She uh, was advisor and speechwriter for um, President Obama, was involved in drafting his controversial Nobel speech in defense of US counterinsurgency in Afghanistan, and has held um, high uh, administration positions of various sorts. Similarly, the authors of the foreword and introduction of the US Army Stability Operations Field Manual, which as I said is another kind of a sister or cousin form of military operation, are also women. Michelle Flournoy and Janine Davidson, respectively. Flournoy was a deputy undersecretary of defense for policy at the Obama Pentagon and was for a while considered a candidate for uh, secretary of defense. Um, and she was also a founder of Center for New American Security, which is an influential security think tank which has been a major and vocal advocate of counterinsurgency. Davidson, Janine Davidson, was in the Bush Pentagon Special Operations and Low Intensity Conflict and Special Capabilities Directorate and was the first Deputy Assistant Secretary um, of Defense for plans in Obama Pentagon. So there are these women who are now circulating in all these very important security roles. Among these women, we can find a liberal interventionist ideology with comfort with security <laughs> speak a curious illusion of femininity to a kind of heteronormative sexuality is present. The images of the counterinsurgent women often show them as feminine. Uh, on their Facebook pages, they're dressed in ball gowns. They're often kissing their counterinsurgent officers, all the while flaunting their warrior credentials. One counterinsurgent woman has been a former Air Force pilot. The other has been a professor at US Marine uh, Corps University, um, and even Paula Broadwell, who uh, is best known as the, uh, uh, as the woman uh, le who Petraeus leaked all sorts of classified information to, um, although she's best known as his mistress, she was actually an intelligence officer in the US Army. Other work is that, um, others work in the Pentagon in various and often influential positions. Here, the gendering of counterinsurgency takes a peculiar shape. Most strikingly, um, a new form of masculinity emerges, authorized by consumerism and new liberal feminism, in which manliness is softened, and the sensitive masculinity of the humanitarian soldier scholar, who's white, literate, articulate, and doctorate festooned, overshadows the hypermasculinity of warrior kings, or indeed of the racialized imperial grunts. This concurrent transformation of ma what masculinity or femininity may mean in the domain of policymaking allows spaces for white middle class women civilians to move into prestigious political positions as counterinsurgents, all the while casting their own advance as a broader victory for the universal woman. This rise of a particular category of women espousing a particular species of feminism is itself indicative of a kind of femininity which is comfortable with and in fact positively values breaking through security spaces coded as masculine, and which appropriates many of the new masculine qualities of the soldier scholars, perhaps as a subspecies of what Judith Butler has provo provocatively called drag, or an uncritical appropriation of sex role stereotyping. So back to the images I showed at the beginning, or I didn't show at the beginning. So this one, and this one, and these, and these. And by the way, I have to talk about this one for just a second because I forgot to do so at the beginning. That image was shown in a lot of the press uh, as, uh, <coughs> as an image of Yazidi, soldier, uh, Yazidi women having been taken captive by, uh, by ISIS. It actually is a picture of a passion play, um, on, of an Ashura passion play in Iran. It has nothing to do with ISIS. There was also reports that ISIS ordered female genital mutilation also turned out to be false. But these kinds of reports about women tend to actually be extremely powerful in terms of showing the brutality of ends. So back to the images I showed at the beginning. It is worth mentioning here then that by appropriating the female Peshmerga Celebrating the Kurdish suicide bombers, where suicide bombing in other contexts is seen as a sign of some essential pathology, we see a representational aspect of preparing for war which differs in content from what I've written about. So there has been a shift in the way that we're thinking about women. The language of protection is invoked in dealing with atrocities against Yazidi women. As an Emirati pilot, an Emirati pilot is seen at once as a symbol of liberation, and because of her family disowning her because of her politics, 
as an embodiment of backwardness of Arabs. This representation of politics is effective precisely because it taps into decades of stereotypes, presumptions, and stories that have turned out to be false. And it also taps into particular configurations of gender and feminism that authorize a particular kind of politics. This representation of politics is so effective because it is made to disappear. We don't think about these images. We expect them, we accept them, we take them on board. It is like an invisible tendon connecting the bones of this machine, making it mobile. And because gendering is so much in the way we think, act, imagine, we don't see the movement of these powerful sinews of war. Thank you very much.